Carter the Power Bryant joins us every Monday, but it's Tuesday because LSU and Iowa played um, yesterday. Good evening, good sir. How are you? Blake, uh, I'm going to be honest. Yesterday was one of the weirdest days I've ever had on YouTube. And okay, honestly, why is that? I, well, I appreciate you hopping on uh, my post game show after uh, the game. Obviously, you know, I respect your, your opinion uh, as much as anyone. But thank you. I even if you factor in all the complicated stories that have happened at LSU, this is definitely the more complex one. And on top of that, I felt like the ending of this game was more complex than the actual championship game last year with all the different tentacles. Oh, heavens, uh, yes. And then you get today that the, the ratings were three million more people on a freaking Monday night with so much different crap going on. And last year, they drew a 9 million person rating, but that was on ABC at 2.30 with not shit else going on in the world. It is crazy what Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark and Kim Mulkey and all the stars did yesterday. So absolutely crazy, and I'm ready to talk about all of it. All right, do you want to start off with this Kim Mulkey basketball stuff, or you want to go to football and then Kim Mulkey? In there? I guess yeah, we should probably go on it since we're already here. Yeah, yeah, you choose. Go on ahead. Okay. Uh, Carter, I, I I just don't understand. I, I don't understand it all. You know, like Jeff Landry coming out today, the governor of Louisiana saying what he said. I, I, like, what what do we – like, I feel like the meteor's coming. I, I feel yeah. like the, the, the meteor's got to be coming, right? Like, I mean, we're, we're all doomed. Yeah, so this is crazy to me, uh, Blake. I, I, I worked on in D.C., and a lot of my friends when I lived in D.C. were like PR political professionals that worked for governors and senators and stuff like that in, in D.C. And, you know, I, I, I wasn't like super close with them, but like when I lived there, we go out, eat dinner, play soccer, what, whatever. And it is amazing how many of them were like shocked uh, at the what, what Jeff Landry did this. Oh, dude. Day. You like, know my you know my background, okay? Yeah, of course. Yeah, there is right. no one that you were the over, least shocked over over a decade. Can I can I just tell you? I I have never been more shocked in my life that a sitting governor would say something like that. How? And, and, and here's the thing, Carter. How dumb can you be? It, they don't. It, they didn't make that decision. Yeah, I, I I will say, and I'm I'm not a politics guy, but me either. Like, like, like I said, I, I, I know people that are, I, 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 I've never seen a more miscalculated move than that. Like <laughs> number more one, more do, miscalculated the move he made today or him throwing out the first pitch the way that he did. <laughs> I don't know e either, either one. I, and look, I, I, I'm not smart enough to be a governor. Okay. But all to, let me let me just say this. If you were an LSU player and your governor, your elected official, came out the day after you lost one of the most gut-wrenching losses uh, you can remember. Maybe in program history. At least since 1-9-12. Uh, it, it felt like that, right? Since right. Because, because of how big it was, how many people were watching, had a, had a number like a national championship game. And if I was a player and I saw an elected official who – Goes to all the LSU teams and smiles, throws first pitches, and acts cool with all of them. And I woke up and I saw that the elected official with the only Power Five state school crapped all over my team. All I would be furious, absolutely furious. If if I was in Jeff Landry's camp, all I would have said was, "Hey, let's call Kim Mulkey and see if we can have the players out for the anthem." Okay. But to publicly call them out like that Very is a calculated move. And and it it's hurtful. It is hurtful, right? That someone that powerful did that. And that's not me being political, right or left or whatever. That that was just really poor taste. And it was like a word salad thing about his mother coaching back then and and then throwing Kim Mulkey in there, it didn't really make sense. And I'm like, oh, he actually is doing uh, this. And that's the thing. It's okay if a talking head, it's okay if 
you have a hot take or me have a hot take. Cause that's we're, we're bloggers. We're, we're social media talking heads. You're an elected official. You don't, you don't do that. That <laughs> you really, really. Well, it'd be one thing Carter, if the normal fan or, or somebody made a mistake, but you have people in your cabinet for that. That's right. what people get hired for. And if right. someone did allowed him to tweet that out, they need to be fired. Okay. And so yeah. uh, even with him and look, I, I feel icky having to come on here and talk sports and politics, but here we yeah. are. And I will tell you, Carter, can I tell you the one thing that is, is killing women's basketball as much as the ratings are fantastic and the game is growing. You know what will kill it more than anything? Let this shit continue to be get political, and the people yeah. that don't want to be around politics will say, you know what? Ain't getting involved. You know why I'm not getting involved? Because every time that we do, this kind of shit happens. Yeah, and and look, I, I'm willing to give Jeff Landry a, a, a mulligan or whatever, but I to do that to Kim, especially knowing what Kim has gone through these last – a very emotional. Do you really think that he knows what she's been through the last week? May, probably not, because if he would have been paying attention to women's basketball, he would have known that it was confirmed by every single member of Louisiana media that the, the team hasn't been out there for years now. You and ever see a, a governor get that ratioed in less than an hour? I honestly no. And look, I know being a governor is a hard job. But if I was an elected official, I would have one of the 50,000 PR people approve every last thing I, I, I tweet out. Every last period, every last comma. Right. Because, uh, like, he literally got a lot of people, and I have a lot of friends on the right, I have a lot of friends on the left that live in Louisiana. Everybody was furious at him. Now, I'll tell you this people outside the state of Louisiana that are, are on his side liked it. And, that's where well, you know, well he, okay that someone who's been in that world for over a decade let me just tell you something you know what he's doing oh he's he's going for the big office one of them it's right. it's one of the most listen it doesn't matter what the state of louisiana thinks about him right now because he'll probably he just got elected in they'll forget about this in four years during election time yeah, but yeah. what people will remember is his track record of standing up for the anthem. It's a cu calculated political tweet for him so that when he needs to get the right base up, he can say, I said stand up for the anthem. And we're so dumb as people, we'll forget what the context was of him standing up for the anthem. Right. And I, I feel I, I I really, really, really do feel bad for Kim Mulkey. And it's 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 hard for I me. I do too. I've, it's hard for me to because Kim has lived a really good life, a life that is is ten times better than almost everyone, yeah. and, and and so on and so on. I really feel bad for what she's gone through these last couple of weeks. And what's really hilarious about that, or ironic, not hilarious, ironic about it, is you know yesterday she did not coach her best game. Uh, she, you know, she got out coached. I mean, and we should yeah. be talking about the game. Right. Carter, she got out coached. I mean, having. Haley Van Lith on uh, Caitlin Clark. Well, not not only Carter. If Haley Van Lith was a thousand percent healthy, okay, and she didn't have the flu, she wasn't getting IVs, whatever. All right, it would even be questionable if she was a hundred percent healthy. But you're and and then Haley Van Lith gets dragged through the mud on social media because of all of this. While Carter, she's going through the flu, yeah, or whatever it is that she's going through. And by the way, I said this on your show last night. You know what's you know what lost in the game? Haley Van Lith ain't lose shit. You can't shoot be one of sixteen from the field in the third quarter and expect to come back on a team like that. Right. That's why, that's why you lost. You Carter, their inconsistency scoring the basketball finally caught up to them. I, I totally agree with you, Blake. And last year, LSU caught a ton of breaks to win the national championship. This year, from the start of the season to now, they just did not catch a whole lot of breaks. Like the only, like the only player on this team that you can legitimately say exceeded her expectations was Flaugé. No, Everyone, 
everyone like we knew Mora was going to be unfreaking believably good. Anyone that watched her, DePaul, would tell her that I, she. I she, thought she underachieved. If I'm being honest. Well, last night you you can make the case, but no, Moro Moro was was her. Moro was her all season long. I, 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 she was oh. good. She wasn't who I thought she would be in crunch time. No, I I, I disagree. I I think I think she I think she was pretty elite. I mean, she was what just outside first team All SEC, and she played both ends of the floor. And by the way, probably played a higher volume of minutes than she. Oh, probably Oh, no doubt. Then, then she probably would have. Swiss Smith Army Knight. Going, Smith going down killed them, dude. Yeah, and and for me, uh, you know, LSU did not get, but and so much is focused on Haley Van Lich just last night. They didn't get what they expected out of her for the entire season, and it's a real juxtaposition of how dominant she was at Louisville, where she was the number one player in the, in the transfer portal over Morrow, and. You know, it, it's still one of the most bizarre things how Ellie Van Lith played this season. I understand it wasn't the best fit. I understand she's not a true distribution point guard. It, it's still very strange. Uh, and some of that might be the flu. Some of that might be all the minutes uh, she had to play. And that's what ultimately did this team in, Blake. The injuries, uh, not having the depth that they had last year. This team was so insanely deep last year. Uh, with Jasmine Carson and Poa being like later bench players uh, on their team. When you only have seven playable players and only four of them are really playing at near their highest or their highest level, it's hard to win a national championship. So I said this before the tournament, Blake, if this team made the Elite Eight and lost to Iowa, I can live with it. I, I, I can. The, the um, problem I had was that Van Lith, if I'm going to get on to her about one thing, when Kaylin Clark goes left, she's going to pull up and shoot. And you got to yeah. know that after the second three. Yes. And, and when she goes right, she's going to drop. I mean, Carter, I ain't trying to be rude to Haley Van Lith. It's not rocket science, buddy. You know, like, I, I mean, I hadn't watched Kaylin Clark all year. And, and, and I knew this going into the game because of what I saw her do last year. She's going to come off a ball screen. She's gonna, If she goes left, she's going to take a little drop back and then shoot. It's her move. And then if she's going right, she's going to try to get to the bucket or she's going to dish. That's all. That's literally her entire game. And if you yeah. couldn't figure that out, and if Kim couldn't figure that out. And look, that loss more on anything, too, from a game plan standpoint was on Kim. And I don't think it's wrong for us to say that Kim just didn't have a good enough game plan there. Right. Uh, Carter, I, I, I came out and started the show and, and said, if you're a racist bigot, leave. So I, I don't really want to go down the road of uh, just like every time I feel like I talk about these stupid idiots, I give them a platform in doing it. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah, it, I, mean, I mean, Blake, it's it's it, it was there. I mean, a, a ton of political commentators uh, could could tell you the same thing. I mean. It, it 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 did turn into one of those types of things and that's obviously a very uh sad thing in a sport that's supposed to you know unite uh, a lot of people some of the nasty memes and uh the the four letter t word getting thrown around uh that rhymes with hug uh when when it comes to well, describing it starts with a t and has hug in it yeah uh and and that word gets thrown around uh, that hurts. Uh, that really hurts uh, players. It doesn't matter if they're making millions of dollars in NIL or not. That's that. That really does hurt them. You know. Uh, you know what's funny about that too, Carter? Uh, at least uh, maybe it's not saying funny, but imagine a defensive coordinator saying that to the best defensive player two years ago. Oh wait. So you want to know a disconnection, but between Matt House and some of his players. There you go. Oh, I didn't know that. Look at you. Well, hey, no, no, I'm not, the, the, I'm, not jo I'm not joking. I got that yeah. confirmed from player and got it confirmed from coaches, position well, coaches. That, well, I'm, go ahead. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad he's out then. Yeah, he's a horrible human being. Speaking of football, let, let's get to some of it. Uh, Carter, let me start with this. Joe Sloan spoke today. With the media, I thought he did. He was fantastic at the mic. Um, anything you took away from Joe Sloan in, in his press conference today? 
Yeah, it's ironic that it's it, it. This was the same thing that happened last year, Blake, when Mike Dembrock gave a very illuminating press conference. It happened the same weekend of of the women's final four. That's right. So, so this year, Sloan's twenty plus minute press conference also flew under the radar. And once again, coordinators are not always made available to the media. The last regime did not do that and uh, unless it was a rare circumstance. Yeah, so the as only an LSU- time that O did it, if you remember, was during COVID. And they did, like, remember Blake Baker was on Zoom. Um, I think Durante Jones was on Zoom. But – it was like ten minutes, and they were out. It was get to know the go know the coaches or something like that. Right. But they never allowed them, you know. After that, right? So you get a full twenty plus minutes uh, to to ask Sloan uh, about a lot of different things, and he spoke about Chris Hilton. Uh, he spoke up for Mason Taylor, uh, and basically said what you you know expect to say. Now, Blake had a very busy day. I was only able to listen to the first like half of it, uh, but. Man, I'm really excited. You know, Joe handled the the part the portions I heard pretty well. I liked what he said about his relationship with Cortez Hankton. And I'm really excited what he's going to do uh, with this offense. And one thing I really liked what he said is offenses at this level and all levels should be built from the inside out. And he was talking about, most importantly, DJ Chester, who's going to Which, be. Which, if there's any comment that he could have had that I was I wanted to hear, it was that. And he knows wow. that. Yeah. And, and that's so key, right? Mm-hmm. That's the one player who unquestionably touches a ball every single time. And he's wearing that number 79 jersey that Lloyd Cushenberry wore. So National title galore. Here we come. So, yeah, I mean, he's he's the key, right? He, he's got to get that ball on the money every single time. And one thing I really do like about him going into next year is is he's got SEC experience, right? Going on the road, stepping in as a third team center. No doubt that he he probably had very small thoughts in his head going into that Missouri game on the road that he was even going to have to play that day. And he stepped up and played admirably. And um, now this is his chance to 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 run this unit that returns the other four starters. So the fact that Sloan said that they built from the inside out is, is absolutely crucial. He talked about the development of Garrett Nussmeyer and Carter. I said this and we've talked about this, me and you probably, and we talked about it the most when Wisconsin during the Wisconsin or after the Wisconsin game, excuse me, was, you know what the best about that game? The best thing that I liked about Garrett Nussmeyer wasn't a long pass that he threw to Chris Hilton on that 99 yard drive. Cause you knew that he could do that. Right. I think Joe Sloan said the biggest thing today about his quarterback is, he, and I'm paraphrasing, when he said Garrett Nussmeyer has to understand when to take the check down and when to throw the bomb. And I think that it's for him to say that tells me that that is a constant conversation that him and Garrett are having on a daily basis. Yeah, it's the inverse of what they were telling Jaden last year. Throw that sucker deep. Throw it more often deep. Right. Uh, and and now it's it's the opposite. And Blake, this is this is what teams are going to do to LSU next year. That they, they, they're going to play a lot of too high. They're going to give you light boxes. So they're not going to let Chris Hilton and Kyron Lacey and Garrett Nussmeyer do what he do, does best and hit deep shots. You're going to have to throw over the middle, take what the defense gives you, you run the and ball. and you got to be able to run the football. More importantly, if you have a bunch of light boxes, and that's something else that Sloan uh, talked about today. So. Garrett, you know, in his press conference uh, a few weeks ago, talked about running when he has opportunities. If teams play a lot more too high in quarters coverage, that does open up more space to to scramble if if pass rushers want to get aggressive in a four man rush, and I, that's going to have to be a little portion of his game. And one thing, Blake, that's happened to me personally, I don't know if it's happened to you, but I, I've started on my SEC channel watching. Uh, all the other quarterbacks in the SEC. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I watch it very critically. There are a lot of guys that are on LSU schedule whose quarterbacks have grown on me. And that doesn't concern me because I think Garrett Nutspire is going to be really good. But it does concern me defensively. I'll tell you this, Blake. I am very high on Connor Wigman. 
this w- t- today was actually the first time I really sat down and 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 watched him, and he is a very very good quarterback. And we got to go to their building. I like Colin Klein as their play caller. I do too. Uh, I I think he's going to make their offense a lot easier. I think they're going to um, be able to generate more explosive plays, even with Evan Stewart out the door. So. I, I the SEC quarterbacks at first glance, I was like, okay, the, the, a lot of unproven guys. I think Garrett clears all of them pretty easily, uh, or most of them pretty clear, uh, easily. But now a lot of these guys ha- have grown on me, so we might have a bunch of high scoring games uh, next year yet again uh, for LSU. The question becomes, can you just make those critical stops when you need to? And if you do that, yeah. you'll be you, you know you'll be fine. Uh, Carter Bryant joining us. Uh, another thing that Joe Sloan brought up. So, Carter, it's one thing when players or coaches talk about players, right? Like in the past, you had coaches who would say, like, oh, oh would say this all the time. Oh, he's looking great in camp. He's looking great. This guy's doing great this spring. And it never panned out that way a lot of times. Oh, yeah. What's interesting to me is, Carter, we've seen Kyron Lacey uh, with our own eyeballs. And, Carter, you have your offensive coordinator saying, listen, man, uh, he he made a massive leap last year. Guys, he's making another one this one. Uh, Carter, we talked about this on your show last night, but I want to re- rehash it because of what Joe Sloan said today. Uh, are we just not talking about Kyron Lacey enough? Yeah, Blake, I it, it's, it's sort of dawned on me that there is a higher likelihood than we would like to think that he is the first player off the draft board next year. Uh, for for before, LSU before Perkins, yeah, because because Perkins is a defensive player. I mean, it's defensive play. I mean, defensive players have become a little bit devalued, especially an off-ball linebacker. Uh, I, I I would not shock me if, if if Kyron Lacy over and I don't think he's a better NFL draft prospect than Will Campbell or Emory Jones. At this, at, I, I would say one of those two guys would be the first off the board. But Kyron has that. And, that you know, Blake, I follow a lot of, of draft analysts. I also follow a lot of analysts in the dynasty fantasy community. Now, this will be the most radical thing I'll say on your show is those guys know ball. I mean, these guys are in these $1,000 leagues, spend tens of thousands of dollars playing these fantasy leagues. And there are guys that, that just watch film. They get all 22 copy and – and they're 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 already planning out the draft for next year. A lot of their prep prep for this year is already done. They're already planning out for next year because you know you're trading picks for the future. We're in a dynasty league together, right? Mm-hmm. And Which I have been there in three months, four months, right? Yeah, I, and and my favorite dynasty analyst, who is sharp as you know what, has Kyron Lacey as a bona fide first round pick going into next year. He is that high on him. And this guy is extremely sharp. And once again, this is someone neutral. He, I don't even know where he lives. I know he's not an LSU fan, though. And he he just he just loves Kyron. So Kyron might be a little underrated, and he could be one of these 60, 70, 80 reception guys next year. I'm going to combat you if it's not Harold Perkins. I could see Will Campbell going ahead of him. Yeah, absolutely. I, I Right now, I would say – it's it's Will Campbell and and or Emory Jones, either one of those two, uh, would w- would go before Kyron Lacey. But at this point, I think Kyron is a day two pick with some day one upside. Uh, I was going to ask you this, but since uh, Anthony B. Saints, this is my last question about this to you. He says, "Ask Blake and Carter, what are y'all thoughts on Cortez and Sloan trying to air the ball out by slowing the tempo to help out the struggling defense?" It's something that you and I have had conversations about Carter see here here's here's the theory that I have if you go back and look at where LSU was snapping the ball on the clock last year Carter they were just to the line they I mean they would go fast but the explosive plays made it seem like they were going a lot faster than they actually were um do you think they slow some things down with a new quarterback maybe go a little bit more 22 on 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 how they do things yeah I could see it I mean Look, I, I'd have to go look. Uh, I was trying to Google this right now. I did, it, this finally clicked, and it's a really good question, Anthony B. Saints. 
I wanted to look at to see what Missouri's like defensive pace of play stats were. Um, I, I I don't I don't remember Missouri being like they a weren't super they weren't fast. They they okay. were a lot like us. They get to the line and get to play in, make an audible or two. I mean, very similar. The difference was they just well, I mean, they did. They had explosive plays, but remember that Tennessee game? Yeah, yeah. Remember yeah. when they choked out Tennessee? Like they just kept running the ball, and uh, who was their yeah. running back? Got uh, uh, Schrader. Oh. Cody Schrader. Cody please. Schrader just lit that ass up, smack at that ass. Um, uh, 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 I, I mean, uh. they choked him out. That's, I mean, to Eli Drinkwitz's credit, man, he would choke you out if you let him. Yeah, I and that might be key for Blake Baker, right? Because, you know, if you're a defensive play caller and you're used to having an offense that's able to run the football, it makes your job a lot easier, Right. Um, as a play caller defensively, if you don't have to call as many plays. And mm-hmm. you made this point, obviously, and as did Anthony B. Saints, you would score so quickly sometimes that a defense that was already struggling wouldn't be able uh, to make the adjustments. So, Carter, we gave them no chance last year. Even though they didn't have a chance, we gave them no chance. And, and the problem with an offense like that, it's a lot of what you ran into in, 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 in 19. And, and, Carter, they did slow – if you remember – Georgia, if you remember Oklahoma, if you remember even Clemson, remember how much in the early part of that game they slowed things down and they threw the ball all over the place, but it was slower. Joe was hitting moderate, you know, completions, and then he'd take the deep shot. I, I just think, Carter, that you got – this is my philosophy. If you give your defense that's not that great zero chance, what do you expect? You're not even game planning – to try to give them the shot. So, for example, in the second half, okay, you you slow things down to try to eat the clock that you were unable to do. Uh, Ryan Yates makes the play on fourth down for you to get the ball back, right? Then you go for it on fourth. You should have punted. You didn't. You just get when you did give them chances, they did succeed. Now, I mean, you got to give them that. They did make actually did make some stops minuscule but i do agree i mean they 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 would occasionally do but honestly to to anthony b saints question the biggest thing that you are going to need right there there are some incomers that i think are newcomers that will move the needle immediately deshaun mcbride deshaun mcbride obviously but what you you're just crossing your fingers that a lot of the four-star pedigree guys that are going into year four of their career takes a leap of some sort. Guys that just did not play well make some type of leap. And one of those guys that's getting gassed up right now is Sage Ryan, right? With the with the pick six and the interceptions in practice, great. Will this actually transition to an actual football field, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, and uh, BT, who's a supporter of yours, he's a supporter of mine. Uh, Brian Turner uh, pointed this out. USC's got really good receivers. Week one, yeah, yeah. that uh, Zachariah Branch is a special football player. So th- they're gonna they're gonna get tested obviously immediately. So Blake, I'm I'm really ex- I'm really excited about Blake Baker. I think he is going to be really good. I do think he is a special defensive play caller. I think. This defensive staff is a very special group. I'm not just saying that to gas this up to all the LSU fans watching this. I, I Since day one, I, I wasn't really high on the last regime. I love this regime. I love what Brian Kelly did, and hopefully a lot of the guys that are in there this spring takes that next leap. I don't – Carter, I, I'm so nervous. About, I, look, I'm not going to bring hash this up again. But I'm so nervous about that interior defensive line. I mean, yeah, you should be. I mean, look, I, I listen to me. Listen, listen to you, buddy. I'm going to give you a hot take that, and nobody's going to agree with me. But when it happens, I'm going to come on the show and say I told you so. Um, USC offensively will have more success as not just offense. I think team wise, because Miller Moss runs their system better than Caleb Williams does. I could see it. I could see it. And Caleb is too improvised. 
Carter, that does not work in that system. I played it for three years. That air raid system, Carter, I promise you, regardless of how, how much they run the football, when you have those principles and you don't go to your read, it will not succeed. And that is I, – I look – Caleb Williams is the biggest – how do I want to say this? It's the biggest fallacy that I think that I can remember. Let me explain. Carter, we look at him because we don't watch a lot of Pac-12 football and say, oh, man, he. I mean, he, we saw the highlights. He had 40 touchdowns. He made great plays. Okay, that's cool. But when he did not run that system, like against Notre Dame, and he tried to do it himself, Carter, it was, it was the, the worst game that I've seen – arguably from a number one overall pick at quarterback in the last decade. Yeah, there, there's been a lot of discussion about that that Notre Dame game. But, you know, as far as Miller Moss is concerned, I do I do agree. Uh, you, you look at Baker Mayfield and a lot of those guys, they more so played within the structure of, of Lincoln's offense, right? And look, how, look what Baker's doing now when he plays into a structure. You can have talent and play into a structure. Yeah, and I w- one – if I were a USC fan, okay, once again, I'm not the big insider or whatever. I don't, the Lincoln Riley thing just kind of feels weird to me. Like, I don't, he doesn't, I've, fit, he doesn't fit them. I've heard things about him not being a first one in, last one out kind of guy. That concerns me. It, 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 it just does. Um, well, and don't, don't say if it concerns you about Lincoln, you know, there's people trying to make those rumors about BK too now. Well, they they don't make sense though because LSU's recruiting right at an extremely high level for <laughs> so so at, at, that USC's not like at the same level that that That's LSU is. Very, well, they so, did they did get four big time commits defensively. Well, yeah, they did they did flip someone, so I might be wrong on that. <laughs> yeah, I mean um, they did go to the state of Georgia, and like Georgia fans were like, "Oh, shizite." So so if Lincoln Riley's watching this. I, I, I apologize. No, he's cooking brisket, smoking I, some brisket. I, I, well, I, I wasn't familiar with your game, Lincoln. I'm sorry. But <laughs> I, 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 ha, I have heard that, and I th- that that does concern me. It also concerns me that it took him this long to finally move on from Alex Grinch, but now they have UCLA's defensive coordinator over now, and and we'll we'll, we'll see uh, what actually transpires uh, in that game, but. You know, for me, Blake, defensively, I do agree to your initial point. The defensive tackle position is has got to get better. Hopefully, uh, Gio, Giovanni, your your Italian brother. At least I think he's Italian. If your name is Giovanni, I uh, think he might be Spanish. Spanish I, ain't no. I listen, they ain't a lot of Italians with a Z in their name, Bucko. I'm just telling <laughs> you. Uh, so, so Gio, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I think he might. I think that might be Spaniard, my guy. It, it might it might be. Which by the uh, way, we're not far from Spain. You know? I mean True. Uh a I lot of know. Italians are technically so here's the thing, the ancestry.com thing, man. I got some Spaniard in my blood. Oh, you do? Okay. Well, Giovanni, I'm I'm sorry. I, I, I support Spain and Italy's national team, so sorry about that. But you know, I, G, Gio grew on me as as uh, a snap eater, a playable guy. Uh, a guy, you know, I actually listened to a full Carter, interview. He's going to start now, though. Yeah, I mean, well, if he came in right now with this D line, he starts. So I'll t- I'll tell you this, Blake. I listened to a full interview he did when when he was with the Badgers, and he's a very smart guy. He understands scheme. He was like he did a whole like answer on switching from Wisconsin's old scheme to what Fickle was doing and having him play straight head up nose, and he. We're talking about how he prefers to play in a, a four-man front, which is what LSU will do. But he also can give you some three-man front uh, capabilities, and he he played hard, right? Is 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 he the next Ricky Jean Francois? Probably not, but he'll Ricky Jean in the house. Ricky Jean, baby, the field goal block master, bro. Uh, what a name for a Louisiana defensive tackle. He is the oh, number one best defensive tackle name of all time for Louisiana. Ricky Jean. Ricky man. Jean Francois. No one can block a kick. Hey, can, I, hey, can I tell you something? Yeah. I, Ricky Jean. So listen to this. Uh, I don't think Brandon would mind me saying this. 
So when LSU played in Atlanta, uh, maybe against Georgia Tech or Clemson, I forget, and the Peach Bowl, I think it might have been Georgia Tech, in 2008, 2009, whenever they played in the Peach Bowl, uh, Richard Dixon was still on that team, I believe. So it might have been 2008. I was at an event in Atlanta and stayed in the same hotel as them, okay, okay. Ran it as LSU. Um. Ricky Jean Francois shows up to the hotel. Okay. And a guy that I um uh, is I'm a friend with, I, who's from the Atlanta area, tells me because somebody called his name, he goes, Who is a Ricky Jean Francesi? And I'm like, oh my God. The obliteration of this man's name is the most Louisiana thing I've ever heard in my life. Franchisee. 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 That's that's good. And I love I love I I'm I love that he stayed in the NFL as long as he did. And he was a good NFL player. Played for longer than I thought that he would. Played yeah, more I'm, than my favorite player in 03, which was Chad Lavalle. Ricky Jean won 03, though. No, that's what I'm saying. Like played oh, more oh, than oh, a guy oh, who played in 03, who I was who was probably my favorite player was uh, was uh um, Chad Lavalle. Yeah, Chad. Actually, Chad's my favorite defensive tackle too. Yeah, uh, me too. Yeah, I'm. I'm more I'm than a, more than Glenn Dor. Uh, Glenn, more than Glenn for me. Yeah, me too. Because I when I when I was a young DT, I, I was in Baton Rouge. I ran into him oh, in the mall, boy. and I freaked out. Like I was like, "Mom, it's Chad Lavalle," and he stopped and talked to us for like 15 minutes. I wish camera phones were around then because I would have taken a photo. Biggest with him. hands. On a human being you'll ever see in your life. Dude had to have, I mean, they look like frying pans. You look like the big show's hands. And that was another case, along with Mo Claiborne, as the biggest shocks I've ever seen not succeeding in the NFL. Like, I, I was, I mean, Chad Lavalle was that mother effer. Uh, in in college, I'm I'm mm -hmm. like if you would have told me Kyle Williams would have lapped him in his NFL career, I would I would have and Kyle Williams was great at LSU, I would have I would have been shocked. Uh, but it goes to show you how tough it is to transition to the NFL. It could be the best college player you could be. It's it's so hard to be dominant at that next level. Tim Debo says hi. All right, anything else we need to get to? Did I miss something? Did I miss any LSU related content that we that we missed on? Angel Reese, if you're watching this, let's run it back. Run it back. All right. I, I here's run my it, thing. Run it back. I understand. I think everybody's saying to run it back because of she'll just be a bigger star in college than she will be in the NBA and make more money. Here's the problem I have with that, especially for women. Is Carter, as someone who is married with two kids, women do think about their biological clock more than men ever will. So I do think that there's something to be said about her needing to go because, and look, just because she's a woman, and I understand that. And I, I'm not trying to be sexist at all. No, no, no. But I, I do think that that factor is a major factor in play in here. And I think that she's got other things that she wants to do uh, as well. Yeah, I've interviewed female athletes uh, about th this very thing. One golfer actually brought it up to me in an interview I did with her a long time ago, and I never really thought about that. Um, and that's that's one thing you got to think about uh, as you know when you compare female and male athletes. So that that is interesting. I I just think she needs to run it back because I I am not sure if she is as WNBA ready as some of the other elite prospects. I, I, I agree with that. In, in the draft and find a mid range. Yeah. And if, and, and if, if she can knock that down consistently, she'll be a very good WNBA player. And I think that's going to be key. You know, you see the NBA has become more spread out. You, you're, you're just not going to be able to just out rebound everybody on the block with putbacks at a higher level. Uh, so, I want Angel to come back because I do think it's best for her, but also I, I don't want this train. I just, I don't want this train to stop. I, I want to keep it going. Yeah, we'll see. And I think 
you know, we'll, we'll just have to see how that goes. Carter, the power of Bryant. Uh, men's basketball, anything that you're excited about with Matt McMahon? No, it, it, did something happen? No, there's something. I mean, they got to recruit. They got to commit in the portal. Bronny James is in the portal, by the way. But let's go. Let's let's go. You know, I mean, talk about talk about having media around you. My goodness. All right.